Imagine an electrically neutral particle at rest, surrounded by its spherical gravitational field or reference frame. Suppose then that this field represents the probability that the particle will move in any direction. Because the particle is at the center of the field, there is no net probability of going in any given direction. Suppose then that the position of the particle does change with respect to its attendant field randomly as by an uncertainty principle. Then that field was moved to a new location to be again centered upon the particle. Now, if the field is limited to finite velocity, it must take on the appearance of an ellipsoid during the time of transition to the new position, which depicts an acceleration of the field. The probability of further particle movement during the time of the field transition is then weighted in favor of return to the old position. I call this probability weighting inertia. Inertia is the response of a particle to its own reference frame when that field is distorted by acceleration. Thus, a neutron at rest may move about randomly in any direction by chance, but in so doing creates the mechanism of its own confinement and has no net propensity to random walk away from its rest position. Observe now that an ellipsoid has two foci, either one of which might be construed as a particle. One focus, the original particle, is in the high-density forward part of the field, and the other in the low-density rearward part. Let us then suppose that over each focus, a charge forms in another field, the electromagnetic field. The neutron then has a ready mechanism of decay into components when and if a random set of position changes stretches the probability field to such extent that each focus experiences random position changes separately that disallow rejoining. That is, as a sort of particle mitosis, each focus takes on an independent existence. One, the forward focus, as a proton, and the other rearward focus as an electron, now subject to other quantum mechanical rules. If the foregoing is true, we will have a neutral particle with an understandable half-life in accord with observation. The next step is to place many neutral particles on a circle and spin the circle such that all the neutral particles experience a centripetal force. Then it is supposed that this artificial force will induce a similar now causal field distortion, resulting in a positively charged forward focus nearest the axis of rotation and a negatively charged rearward focus away from the axis with all centripetal vectors pointing toward the axis and all lying in the plane of rotation of the circle. Now, place the entire circle over one pole of a magnetic field such that both positive and negative ends of the formerly neutral fields experience the same magnetic field. Then, we have that one of the induced charges will be moving in a magnetic field in a manner consistent with the right-hand rule, and the other forced in opposition to the right-hand rule. The acceleration-induced charge, which is consistent with the right-hand rule, will experience a net repulsion away from the magnetic field pole, as though at one end of a magnetic bottle. The acceleration-induced charge forced to move in opposition to the right-hand rule will experience a net attraction toward the magnetic pole. Because each moving focus experiences an opposite force in the presence of the same magnetic field, the centrifugal vector of the original neutral particle is now tilted out of the plane of rotation 
resulting in a net axial vector. That is, the gravitational fields of the original neutral particles would give a net probability of movement up or down instead of the normal state of balanced vectors within the plane of rotation. And this probability is unopposed by any net reaction with the magnetic field which caused the imbalance. The potentially enormous centrifugal forces confined within the plane of rotation can then be redirected to create reactionless acceleration, which is opposed only by the inertia of the non-rotating body of the supposed craft. The existence of this redirected vector would constitute a violation of linear momentum conservation and by logical extension, angular momentum conservation as well. The form factor of such a device would be disc-shaped and would involve rotation and the attendant effects of rotation, as well as very strong magnetic fields, regardless of materials used and any other technological requirements. To move laterally with respect to the axis of rotation, would require alternating fields on one side of the craft, which would effectively shorten the net vector on that side of the craft, causing a lateral movement in the opposite direction. However, the preferred direction of motion would be along the axis of rotation, which requires a constant field applied to the rotating circle, rather than the more complicated heat-inducing application of alternating fields. To reorient the craft, it is only necessary to create an excess up or down force at one position on the rotating wheel and allow precession to occur. Because this propulsion mechanism is reactionless, the craft may undergo uniform acceleration for indefinitely extended periods using an internal linear power output to achieve geometrically increasing kinetic energies. That is, it is not subject to Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation or the law of conservation of energy and is therefore a suitable propulsion mechanism for interstellar travel. The mechanism here proposed is sufficiently detailed to support experiment and is falsifiable. If true, it must necessarily require huge centrifugal forces and extremely strong magnetic fields as judged by observer reports of the actual extraterrestrial craft. The transition of this effect from unobservable to dominant would follow a double curve similar to that shown. If the tangent to the curve at the point of inflection has a steep slope, the effect may appear suddenly near that position. This would necessarily be the primary propulsion mechanism of all extraterrestrial craft. However, there is clearly another gravitational component to this mechanism, alluded to in my other video, that should be energy and momentum conservative, and would be suitable for the mitigation of the unwanted ancillary effects of acceleration and possibly for obtaining over light speed velocity. This is the effect that may have been discovered by Potklatnov and others.